Funding for Shape Realist is provided by Squarespace, the sponsor of today's video. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. It has been a hot minute since I made a love letter to a DreamWorks film. Like, I think the last one was in December 2020? Yeah, we should probably get another one going. Let's see here. Eeny, meeny, miny, you. The universe has brought us my next DreamWorks analysis video. What? 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 So, uh, Kung Fu Panda is really good. Like, really great. Like, extremely excellent. Like, incredibly fucking amazing in ways you would never guess if you haven't seen it before. From the tight screenplay with hardly any wasted scenes, to the unbelievably stellar fight choreography and overall direction, yeah, I'm pretty comfortable calling this film a masterpiece. I've been prone to overuse that term in the past, I will admit, but here we have a shockingly ambitious film that lives up to all of said ambitions and undoubtedly deserves the masterpiece label in my eyes. I think most people, and especially most people who watch my channel, already know this, but I also think it's about time I take a deep dive into why why this movie is as amazing as it is. And we'll get to the other two eventually, don't you worry. I just figured I'd start one of these DreamWorks retrospective serieses off with the first film for a change, cause I woke up in a logical sort of mood today for some reason. And there was no way in hell I was doing the entire trilogy in one video like a bunch of you requested, cause there's way too much to say about each individual film to do that. This isn't like Madagascar where my entire analysis boils down to, this one is funny and this one is not funny, didn't laugh. The thematic depth of each installment in the funny Jablinski Games Panda movie trilogy is incredibly significant and truly a sight to behold. So let's finally dive into the first movie proper, starting with... The reveal of what's on the Dragon Scroll. Yeah, we're just gonna get that out of the way right now. And it's... <gasps> Squarespace! So that's the secret ingredient to building an amazing website. Who knew? Uh, yeah, let me talk about Squarespace some more now, and then we will get to funny panda moments. Squarespace is a fantastic, intuitive, online website builder that allows you to create beautiful websites for your business or personal hobby. Present your work using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs. Display projects in customizable galleries and add password-protected pages to share private works with clients. You can even present your videos from YouTube, video Vimeo, and Animoto on your Squarespace site. Add an image overlay to your video to improve your website's load speed by waiting to embed video players until playback starts. Every design automatically includes a unique mobile presence that matches the overall style of your website, so your content will look great on every device, every time. And if you don't want that, you can always disable the mobile view from Website Manager. Buying a domain from Squarespace is so simple because there are no hidden fees or price hikes. Each domain comes with an ad-free parking page and free WHOIS privacy on eligible domains domains. Squarespace sells over 200 top-level domains so you can find the perfect name for your website. Choose a URL that ends in .com, .net, .org, or you can always get a more specific one like .art if you want to be fancy. If you're ready to share your passions or promote your business with the rest of the world, head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Okay, now back to the movie. Our first topic of discussion is... as well kick things off with one of the simplest aspects of the movie to talk about, the funny. Yeah, this movie's very funny. What I like about the humor here is that it could have so easily gone into typical DreamWorks fart poop humor bullshit nonsense chicanery. I mean, you got a movie where Jack Black is a big fat panda. How easy would it have been to just make the panda fart and have that be the humor? We did it, guys. Comedy is saved. But yeah, Kung Fu Panda doesn't do that because it's a Chad movie that actually writes and tells jokes. A lot of the humor comes from Poe's boundless enthusiasm for Kung Fu despite his lack of skill or talent, as well as the contrast between his laid-back lifestyle and the rigorous attitude of Shifu and the Five. The contrast even works well between Po and Tai Lung. One scene that always cracks me up is when Po has to reach the Dragon Scroll, so he imagines it as a cookie. Tai Lung is completely oblivious to this fact, however, and assumes that the scroll has given him power! It's a very funny little moment that also speaks to how much people underestimate Po's unique abilities. Not only are the jokes as written pretty funny, but the entire cast has such good 
comedic timing, and they make so much of the humor land. Jack Black is excellent as Poe, and really breathes life into the character, making him his own. It's such a match made in heaven, and I can't imagine anyone else playing this character. It doesn't feel like a lame celebrity stunt casting like most Seth Rogen roles do, and oh yeah, Seth Rogen's in this movie. Okay, let's just move past that. He's he's fine. He's, he's inoffensive in this. It's just whatever. It's... Meh. I think Ian McShane's performance as Tai Lung is really underrated. It's not only menacing, but he also does a great job with the larger-than-life comedic scenes. There's a reason why- Finally, a worthy opponent. Our battle will be legendary! Became a meme, after all. James Hong as Mr. Ping? Come on, man! I can't get enough of his voice. It's so distinct and energetic and funny. His love of noodles and soup is just so infectious. You can feel the passion James Hong brings to every role. And this one is no exception. Lastly, I wanted to highlight Randall Duck Kim, because his delivery really does add a lot to the surprisingly effective comedic moments with Oogway. This turtle boy may be the wise old mentor figure, but he's also allowed to have his fair share of kooky moments that endear us to his character without ruining the tone of important scenes. One of my favorite examples is when he's like, There is just news. There is no good or bad. Only for Shifu to tell him that Tai Lung escaped, with his response being, That is bad news if you do not believe that the dragon warrior can stop him. This joke works so well because it's a funny reaction we didn't expect from Oogway, but after a comedic pause, he continues the sentence and reveals that he's not actually contradicting his previous stance. Attention, funny joke, that also does not undermine the character. Another example is when Shifu asks him who the dragon warrior is, and he just responds with, I don't know. Because, yeah, he doesn't Monkey. yet. That's what the ceremony they immediately hold right afterwards is for. Even during his silliest scenes, the movie always maintains Oogway's wise persona and doesn't contradict itself, which is how it's done. So yeah, the movie has a pretty good sense of humor. It's not the all-time funniest DreamWorks film or anything, but it still has a lot of good laughs and memorable line deliveries that really stuck with me to this day. But that's not really the main appeal of this movie. Let's talk about... Bro, how are the fights in this movie so good? Like, what the hell? I legit don't even know where these intense, gripping, utterly phenomenal action sequences came from. DreamWorks has never really been known for action before. Prior to this point, they've just kind of been the funny haha -ha Shrek guys. I guess the Shrek movies have had some action in them, but nothing on this level. Like, we love the I need a hero sequence for the music, the story tension, the humor, all that jazz. Phenomenal scene, but it's not like the actual battle choreography is anything special. But this movie is just... God damn! It's an actual martial arts movie with animated animals. In fact, looking into the movie's development, it was first conceived as a spoof movie before John Stevenson, one of the directors, retooled it to be more of a character-based wuxia comedy. Obviously, this was an excellent choice, since DreamWorks already had a big spoof franchise in the form of Shrek, and I doubt Kung Fu Panda would be looked upon as fondly if it was just Shrek again, but a martial arts parody instead of a fairy tale parody. In an interview, Stevenson stated, Our choice was not to do the parody or the simplistic comedy. We said, Let's take Kung Fu Panda, which is an idea everybody gets comedically, but then let's try and surprise everybody by giving them more movie than they might expect from the title. Let's try to make it a real martial arts movie, albeit one with a comic character, and let's take our actions seriously. Let's not give anything up to the big summer movies. Let's really make sure that our Kung Fu is as cool as any Kung Fu ever done, so that we can take our place in that canon and make sure it's a beautiful movie. Because great martial arts movies are really beautiful looking movies. And then let's see if we can imbue it with real heart and emotion. We kind of hoped that maybe when people see the movie, they'll be surprised that they get a bit more movie than they may be expecting from the title. Needless to say, they succeeded. Kung Fu Panda was at the time the most complex film DreamWorks had ever made from an animation standpoint. And you can tell that just by looking at it. The sheer effort it took to choreograph these fight scenes, to make sure the Kung Fu was fast and dynamic and exciting, while also maintaining a resemblance to real life martial arts, I truly do not envy these animators, man. But, thanks in no small part to the top-notch direction, they really pulled through and delivered some beyond incredible sequences that I still feel are a bit slept on by the general public, despite how well received this movie was. Like, I'm shocked animation Twitter does not pop the f off every other week talking about the stellar choreography, camera work, lighting, and feeling of overall awesomeness at play during every one of this movie's action sequences. 
Prior to his prison escape, Tai Lung is talked about as someone to be feared. But then we actually get to the prison, and we see how impossible it must be to get out of here. It's so far underground, there's a thousand guards and only one prisoner. One way in, one way out. And he's chained up in a giant turtle shell contraption. He'll never get away! Oops, he got away. But the way he gets away is just... Oh man! I'm still geeking out about it! He uses a single feather to unlock the pressure points in his shell. A feather he only got a hold of because Shifu sent a messenger bird to the prison to make sure he didn't escape. Shifu's actions inadvertently caused this whole debacle, which Ugwe did try to warn him about. One often meets his destiny on the road he takes to avoid it. Everyone knows how that line foreshadows Shifu's contributions to Tai Lung's escape, but I personally think you can even feel the echo of it when Tai Lung is trapped by these heavy weights, only to break free thanks to the crossbows firing at him and breaking his chains. Yeah, maybe you guys should have just not shot at him since he was still trapped, but oh well, live and learn. Assuming these guys did live, because I don't know, I think they might have all died in this fight. Anyway, wordlessly we get to see Tai Lung's ingenuity at work using the crossbow ammunition as springboard so he can propel himself upward. And then this fucking shot, man. The contrasting colors between him and the arrows, the immensely satisfying sound when they all hit the elevator, just, oh god, it goes so hard. I'm not gonna do a play-by-play -play of everything in this fight scene, don't worry. But I just can't stress enough how flippin' cool all of it is. The movie sets up the sheer improbability of anyone escaping this place, and then it shows us how effortlessly Tai Lung makes quick work of every trap in his way, and every guard unfortunate enough to cross his path. It even manages to be stunningly epic while also keeping the comedic tone intact, like when he stuffs a mace in this guy's mouth and cartoonishly sends him flying. In the time it takes this guy to fly through the air, Tai Lung has already taken out like 10 10 other guys on ground level. He then catches this guy and throws him into another guy. I had to play this at 0.5 speed just to make sure that's what I was seeing. Just who choreographed this and can we give them a gold medal? Can animating unbelievably stellar fight scenes be an Olympic sport now? This scene is the moment where the movie proves it's more than what it was letting on. It's more than just a cute, goofy, haha, funny Jack Black Panda comedy. It's a goddamn real ass kung fu movie and it deserves to be recognized as such. I'll fully admit that the action in this movie, hell, in the entire trilogy really, does kinda peak with this scene, but it's not a huge gap. The other fight scenes in this movie are definitely up to the same standard, and they only barely fall short of this one. Like, the bridge scene is just so phenomenal. It's such a creative and precarious location for a battle to take place at. You're constantly fearful that these characters are gonna fall into the abyss. Plus, Tai Lung's ferocity is even more potent here than it was in the last battle. Between him slamming Tigress across the boards on the bridge, and choke holding her with the ropes, you just remain incredibly fearful of what he's capable of, even when the five theoretically should hold the advantage. They even still keep the humor intact, with Viper forcing Tai Lung to hit himself, and Mantis inexplicably being left alone on rope duty. It's just such an incredibly thrilling action set piece that concludes with an absurd display of Tai Lung's abilities. Well, like, for real, how did he do that? It's also a great showcase for one of my favorite little details about the Furious Five. The fact that they're all based on real-life martial arts techniques, meaning the animal they are actually informs their fighting style. It's just so cool, man. Oh my god. They're so cool, they're so cool, they're so cool! As for the next major fight in the film, Shifu vs. Tai Lung, we'll talk about that one later, since it's less about the stellar action and more about the amazing character drama the confrontation delivers. But for now, let's move on to that final confrontation between Poe and Thailand. It's the goofiest and most loosely choreographed out of all the fights in this movie, which makes perfect sense since Poe's brand of kung fu is so unconventional. But the creative ways he keeps the scroll out of Tai Lung's hands, utilizing everything in his general vicinity and calling back to previous scenes during his training, is a really nice touch. I always particularly liked how he hid the scroll under a bunch of pots and mixed them all up as a callback to when Shifu did that with his dumpling. See, there, Poe actually played along with Shifu's game and found it the way he was supposed to, while Tai Lung takes the easy way out and just knocks all the pots away, cause he lacks patience and doesn't want to abide by the rules of the game. And cause he's evil and shit. It's a nice way of showing the contrast between the two characters. Overall, I think what this scene does best is make it believable that Poe could beat Tai Lung, using all of his unconventional and unexpected tactics. Considering how Tai Lung wins every single battle he's in over the course of the film, the concept of our flabby panda buddy successfully taking him out at the end seems less and less possible. But this fight really sells the concept that Poe could eke out a win without nerfing Tai Lung in the process. Especially because Tai Lung kinda wins at first, knocking Poe down and getting the scroll only to realize that it's black 
blank as shit. Knowing that the limitless power he hoped to acquire all his life was a lie, he's probably not in the best mental state during this final confrontation, and Poe can easily take advantage of his blind rage. It's ultimately a very effective final confrontation that trades in some of the more visceral action from earlier in exchange for a wonderful expression of what makes Poe special. Speaking of Poe and his specialness, I'd like to talk about him and his wonderful journey over the course of the movie. Because he has a little something called imposter syndrome. I sense the dragon warrior is among us. Among us! That is impossible! I touched upon this briefly in my Shrek 2 analysis from many, many years ago, but one of the central themes of Kung Fu Panda is that of imposter syndrome. You know, it's funny, I didn't actually know there was a name for imposter syndrome back when I wrote the Shrek 2 script, despite having it all my life. And in a post-Amogus world, I wish I didn't know the name for it and could live in blissful ignorance. But that time has passed. Anyway, while I do think imposter syndrome was handled in a slightly more compelling way in Shrek 2, Kung Fu Panda's depiction of it is still really strong. Poe pretty much experiences the textbook definition of it. After Ugwe chooses him to be the dragon warrior seemingly by accident, he's suddenly thrust into a prominent position, surrounded by people he perceives as being much more capable and deserving of his title. But Poe's strength as a character is his unbridled enthusiasm and optimism. He doesn't initially doubt he can be the dragon warrior, he just assumes that first Shifu needs to train him to fill that role. And so he refuses to quit, taking beating after beating, but still staying for more because he believes he can do it. Initially, he's pushing through the imposter syndrome, but that doesn't mean it isn't still there. One of my favorite scenes is when he accidentally barges into Crane's room at night. And like, Crane's trying to be courteous and nice, despite the fact that he trained his entire life to reach a certain position, and then it was just given to some random panda that fell right out of the sky. But then Crane blurts out, you don't belong here. Which Poe interprets as the same thing his imposter syndrome has been telling him deep down. That he doesn't belong here at the Jade Palace, training alongside his idols he could never hope to live up to. He expresses his reluctant agreement with what Crane said. But Crane feels bad about this and backpedals, saying he was just talking about not belonging in his room. So Poe leaves, a little embarrassed, but mostly relieved. And then Tigress opens her doors to say the same thing. You don't belong here. Poe interprets this the same way Crane apparently meant it, that he doesn't belong in her room. And then she proceeds to clarify that she doesn't think he belongs here, at the palace, learning kung fu alongside the masters, and that he should leave if he has any respect for them. The fact that she specifically said, you don't belong here, after Crane did, implies that she could hear their conversation, and that she specifically chose the words that would cut Poe the hardest. It's such a great scene for establishing not only Poe's naivete and earnestness, but also how ruthless and blunt Tigress is, especially compared to the rest of the five, who keep their frustrations and disappointment inside. While we're on the subject, I just like how the five are written in general, and how distinct all their positions are on Poe. They're admittedly not the most fleshed out in this first movie, or any of the other movies, honestly. But they all express differing opinions on Poe through their dialogue. Tigress is incredibly frustrated with him and isn't afraid to share that fact. Mantis and Monkey aren't afraid to crack jokes at his expense, and Viper and Crane are more compassionate and concerned about his well-being. There's also some solid growth where we get to see them gradually warm up to him over time. But we're not there yet. Right now, Poe has been thoroughly ratioed by Tigris, and his imposter syndrome is taking over. He tells Ugwe about how much he sucked today, and how much the five hate him, and how he thinks he should just quit and go back to making noodles. But Ugwe comes in clutch with the sage wisdom he's known for, essentially telling him to put this day behind him and keep moving forward. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. That is why it is called the present. So Poe takes this advice to heart and pushes through his imposter syndrome. He pushes through an intensely rigorous day of training specifically designed to get him to quit. He consistently fails, but he refuses to give up in the hopes that he can live up to the expectations thrust upon him. And the five start to take notice. Minus Tigress, of course. But the rest of them start to bond with him, performing acupuncture on him to heal his wounds, admiring his cooking, and joking around with him at dinner. And for these brief moments, Poe finally gets to know what it feels like to belong alongside his idols.
but it doesn't last. Word comes in that Tai Lung has broken out of prison and is on his way. And Poe doesn't take this news well. <laughs> And this, right here, this is the scene where all of it just comes out. All of Poe's insecurities and frustrations he's kept bottled up inside for so long. He admits that he would rather be verbally and physically berated by Shifu while trying and failing to learn Kung Fu because he prefers it over every day of his life just being himself. He held out hope that Shifu could train him to be the Dragon Warrior, completely changing himself in the process. But now, he sees this as an impossible task, and challenges Shifu to prove otherwise. Which Shifu isn't sure how to do. And it's like, fuck man. Imagine being this discontent with your life and who you are, only to suddenly get a chance to live and train alongside your heroes, believing this is it. This is your dream come true. This is your chance to be the kind of person you've always wanted to be. But everyone seems to hate you, especially the person who's supposed to be your mentor, your guide through this vast new world you're otherwise unprepared for. And not only do you not have guidance or friends, but you're the same person you were when you started. You can't live up to these crushing expectations and become this entirely new, capable person you expected to be by now. It's honestly soul-crushing, but it's what Poe has to go through. But Poe eventually overcomes this, thanks in no small part to Shifu overcoming his biases about Poe. We'll get to that in a bit. Before I discuss the resolution of Poe's arc, I think it's about time we talk some more about Tai Lung. Yeah, we're not really supposed to talk about him. Tai Lung is, in my opinion, a far more fascinating antagonist than a lot of people give him credit for. I actually slightly like him better than Lord Shen from the sequel. They're both surprisingly compelling villains, but I think the sheer ferocity of Tai Lung, on top of his super dramatic story, is what puts him over the edge for me. Like I said before, his fight scenes are phenomenal, and we got a sense of how animalistic and powerful he is in the prison break scene, since he manages to pull off all of these feats without speaking a single word. He's like the Kung Fu Panda version of Darth Maul, giving us an intense, silent action scene first, on top of rich, dramatic characterization later on. The only difference is, we get both of these in the span of one movie, rather than it being in one movie and a TV show 10 years after the fact. So shortly after his prison break, we get to hear Tai Lung's backstory recounted to us by Tigris. She is essentially just using it to make Poe feel worse about himself, so it has a purpose to the narrative while also giving us, the audience, exposition. Coolio. Essentially, Shifu raised Tai Lung as his son training him in Kung Fu and telling him he was destined for greatness, to be the Dragon Warrior. However, Ugwe refused to let this happen due to the darkness he saw in Tai Lung's heart. Tai Lung was outraged and laid waste to the valley, trying to take the scroll for himself, all as Shifu remained emotionally powerless to stop the boy he raised. After Ugwe took Tai Lung down and sent him off to prison, Shifu was heartbroken and never truly recovered from this. He never loved another protege in the same way as he did Tai Lung. Presumably not only because he didn't want to raise their hopes too high like he did before, but also because he was too afraid to express genuine care for anyone else, lest he run the risk of getting his heart shattered all over again. It's a fairly standard but incredibly well-executed bit of backstory for both Tai Lung and Shifu. And more than anything else, it expertly sets up their inevitable confrontation towards the end of the film. This is without a doubt my favorite scene in the movie. Not just because it's a cool as shit fight scene, but because it's the perfect conclusion of both characters' storylines. Tai Lung calls his old master, his father figure, out for abandoning him and denying him the title of Dragon Warrior once Ugwe said no. And even though he's not the true Dragon Warrior, he's not wrong in pointing out how messed up it is for Shifu to get his hopes up all those years. To train him until his bones cracked, only for him to find out that all of it was for nothing. The true tragedy of the character is that you can see exactly how Shifu made him this way. How his constant praise was translated into arrogance. How his insistence in Tai Lung's destiny as the Dragon Warrior resulted in a genuine betrayal when it turned out Shifu was wrong. The scars of Shifu's failure continued to haunt him for years, resulting in him never truly being able to love another of his protégés. He suffered, his future students suffered, but most of all, Tai Lung suffered. 
he sealed his fate by succumbing to his rage. But ultimately, it was Shifu's well-intentioned but deeply misguided kindling of Tai Lung's ego that caused him to turn out as evil as he did. It's why, after a verbal confrontation and a fight with incredible art direction and intensely dramatic shots like, seriously, why does this movie go so hard for real? We get this last moment between them, where Tai Lung mockingly demands to know how proud of him Shifu is. And Shifu solemnly expresses how proud he was, and how his pride blinded him from what he was turning Tai Lung into. The power in this scene derives from Shifu fully taking responsibility for ruining Tai Lung's life with empty promises, and finally telling Tai Lung he's sorry. And this one reaction shot of Tai Lung, this right here, that's the best shit in the whole film. It's the look of someone who, despite all the evil they've done, has nonetheless been genuinely touched by the apology. The acknowledgement of negligent wrongdoing that set them down this dark path that they never expected to receive. You even see his eyes start to well up before he realizes he's gone too far to turn back now and insists that he doesn't want Shifu's apology. But the eyes don't lie. Hearing a parent admit that they failed you instead of blaming you for your own shortcomings is some pretty powerful stuff and it's especially rare to hear in a movie for kids. And yet, Tai Lung is too far gone, too consumed by his hatred, and too entrenched in the pursuit of the power he was wrongfully promised. He wants his scroll. So Poe shows up and they fight over it and blah blah blah, other cool thematic stuff is revealed through their contrasting reactions to the scroll or something, blah blah blah, let's discuss. Now that we've covered Poe and Tai Lung's journeys over the course of the film, it's time to bring it all home and compare their reactions to getting what they've always wanted. The source of limitless power, the Dragon Scroll. Okay, so before we get to that, there's a really good scene earlier in the movie with Uguay, which I know is kind of a redundant sentence okay. because every single scene with Uguay is automatically really good, but it's the scene where Uguay tells Shifu that he needs to let go of the illusion of control. Shifu has tried in vain to train Po the usual way, to implement the same level of control that he had during the training of Tai Lung in the Furious Five, and it hasn't worked out. Bonk. But through this clutch-ass peach tree metaphor, Ugwe lets Shifu know that he needs to be patient. He can't make a peach tree blossom when it suits him, nor bear fruit before it's time. But Shifu's like, well actually, I can control where the fruit will fall and where I plant the seed, so you're wrong, plus ratio, plus you fell off. And Uguay's like, you silly head, that plant is always gonna be a peach. You may wish for an apple or an orange, but you will get a peach. And a peach can defeat Tai Lung. If you believe in it, you just gotta believe! Then Uguay dies, and the music is fucking phenomenal. Hans Zimmer and John Powell really pop the fuck off and contribute to one of the most beautiful moments in the entire trilogy. Everyone loves this scene, and I'd be remiss to not mention it at some point. After this, we get that scene where Poe finally lets all his insecurities out to Shifu, and then the next day, we see Poe accidentally performing some advanced kung fu maneuvers in order to get food. Except, there are no accidents. Are there? No. Shifu finally understands the meaning of Uguay's thrice-repeated message, and this is how it finally clicks for him that he can train Po by meeting the panda on his own wavelength and instructing him in a way he'll actually respond to. With food. God, I'm fucking hungry. It's almost like different people learn differently or something, and trying to standardize a method of learning will inevitably leave certain students behind. Hmm. I am going to send the CEO of the American school system a DVD copy of Kung Fu Panda so they can see what a fucking idiot they are. Sorry, what was I saying? Oh yeah, this is the first indication of the potency of the movie's message, which essentially boils down to what makes you different makes you special. It's a pretty standard message on its own, but the way it's presented in this movie really does feel fresh and unique. Poe's distinct love of food, his round physique, and his boundless optimism against all odds all come in handy for him as he manages to beat his master in a kung fu dumpling battle. And then after winning the dumpling, he says he's not hungry. A subtle callback to Tigris saying the dragon warrior can survive for long periods of time without eating. 
Or maybe he just didn't want to eat the dumpling because it was bouncing around everywhere and it's probably really gross now. That's probably the reason. I'm trying to watch my calorie intake. Either way, we've seen Poe go from complete embarrassing novice to someone who's actually pretty capable in the art of kung fu. All because Shifu adapted his training method to what worked best for Poe and what brought out Poe's unique inner strengths. And after the five return home defeated, it becomes clear that in order to beat Tai Lung, it's time for Poe to learn the secrets of the Dragon Scroll and become immortal! But upon opening it... WHAT THE FUCK?! Yep, this bitch empty. Yeet. Everyone is justifiably really confused and scared, since they all believe that Poe is no match for Tai Lung without the sort of supernatural power they assume the scroll would give him. And it's a perfectly reasonable assumption. Tai Lung seems utterly unstoppable, and if the Furious Five couldn't beat him, how can Poe do it without any special ability? So they evacuate the valley and Poe returns home to Noodle Dad James Hong, who sees how upset Poe is and tries to cheer him up by telling him the secret ingredient of his secret ingredient soup. And it's also nothing. There's no need for any sort of special sauce or secret ingredient, because to make something special, you just have to believe it's special. Like Ugwe did when he selected Poe and insisted it was no accident. Like Shifu did when he finally put his preconceived notions about Poe aside and trained him in the way that brought out his special attributes. And now it's time for Poe to come full circle, let go of his doubts, deny his imposter syndrome, and finally tell himself that yes, he does deserve the title of the Dragon Warrior. He stuck with his passion, he put in the work, and he earned the title that no one, not even he, thought he could live up to. If his dad can make plain old noodle soup taste unbelievably amazing, then why can't he, a big, fat panda, become the legendary kung fu master he always aspired to be? Wait, wait, you motherfucker! So Poe arrives to save Shifu and do battle with Tai Lung, keeping the Dragon Scroll out of his hands by utilizing the unconventional abilities that make him special. A perfect reflection of everything he's learned throughout his training process. Ultimately, however, Tai Lung knocks him down and finally seizes the scroll for himself, opening it up to once again reveal... nothing. He's obviously shocked, but Poe gently explains the scroll's meaning to him, how there's no secret ingredient, and that it's just him. And where Poe found the power to believe in his own strength through this revelation, Tai Lung just can't do that. His entire life, he believed in the promise of greater power, some sort of ability the scroll would bestow upon him in order to make him truly unstoppable. His rejection of the true nature of the Dragon Scroll speaks to his inability to accept his true self and come to terms with who he truly is, as Poe has. By pushing past his self-doubt and returning to fight Tai Lung without any quote-unquote mystical power in tow, Poe proved himself to be the true Dragon Warrior. And by rejecting the scroll's message as it was explained by Poe, Tai Lung proved that the title of Dragon Warrior is something he could never live up to. He instead relentlessly attacks Poe, ultimately failing to defeat him due to a combination of Poe's unique special attributes. He's too flabby for Tai Lung's nerve attacks to do any damage, something that was foreshadowed earlier when Mantis couldn't find his nerves while doing acupuncture. Poe also uses his girth to knock Tai Lung around in unconventional ways, and ultimately finishes with the iconic Wuxi finger hold, something he picked up the knowledge of through his insane levels of dedication and passion to the art of Kung Fu. Skadoosh indeed. I guess according to the third movie, all this did was send Tai Lung to the spirit realm, but I kinda like the eight years of bliss where we thought Poe literally just murdered Tai Lung. That's just me though. And the ending is so wholesome and rewarding. It's so great to hear the five, most of whom belittled him over the course of the movie, finally showing their respect and calling him master. It's so great to see Shifu finally find inner peace, with the mistake he made with Tai Lung finally resolved now that he trains the true Dragon Warrior. There's even a cute, imaginative 2D credit sequence, with a similar art style to the opening dream sequence of the movie. And a post-credit scene? I literally did not know this movie had a post-credit scene until this year when I started working on this video. Who knew? I wonder if this video will have a post-credit scene. The answer is no, but let's move on to the conclusion.
Is it possible for a critically acclaimed blockbuster that spawned an entire franchise to be a bit underrated? Cause that's how I feel about Kung Fu Panda. It's obviously still talked about and still beloved by a ton of animation fans, but I feel like not enough people give credit to how artistically special it is under the surface of its goofy premise and silly jokes. It legitimately stands as one of the most impressive animated action films ever made. At the very least, it's definitely got the best action in DreamWorks' entire catalog, even outdoing its two sequels in this department. It also offers compelling character drama for both its hero and villain, wonderful music, excellent art direction, good humor, just pretty much everything you could ever want in a movie. I'm sure you've already seen it before, but maybe give it a rewatch because it holds up exceptionally well, and I would love to see more people discuss its dramatic strengths. Speaking of dramatic strengths, you better believe I'm gonna talk about Kung Fu Panda 2 sooner or later. That's a movie I absolutely have no trouble calling underrated, so stay tuned for that. And then I guess I'll talk about 3 as well, I mean sure why not. Good night, Valley of Peace.